we'll get rolling here just to get started. And as people join in, they'll uh, we'll bring them up to speed. I'm just going to start with an intro on uh, how things are, are going to roll out for this uh, second uh, webinar in our series of uh, restoring, uh, planning and restoring right of ways um, and corridors for uh, pollinator habitat. So we've got about uh, 50 or so people um, on listening in here. So this is great. We get a good attendance and a few more are rolling in, I think. Um, so I'll just um, start with a couple of housekeeping um, uh, ideas and things to bear in mind as we're going through this. Um, we're going to use the, the chat I have open if anybody can't hear me uh, well or um, uh, make sure I'm on mute. Um, uh, can't hear me well or need some technical things, can't see the video or something like that. You can, there's the chat, but there's also the question and answer uh, portion. So we're going to have the questions written in through the Q&A, which you can find if you scroll either to the top or bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A tab. So you can type your questions into there. I'm going to be monitoring them as we go and uh, we'll compi I'll compile them as we go. So you can ask questions as we go, but we're gonna put the questions to the presenters at the end, unless there's something technical and I can kind of write something quickly back. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna send save those to the end. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. This, this um, webinar we're recording as well, so it, uh, it will be available. Like the one is, we had one uh, back in December, which is, available uh, to view now after the fact. It's uh, on our CWF webinar page, which um, we can send a link around, but if you Google CWF webinar, uh, you'll find that uh, landing page and you can view our first installment of this series. So I am just gonna start. Uh, James, I'm James Page with um, the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, and uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what CWF is, um, as far as uh, sorry, I'm just going to bring this up. Here we go. Um, so CWF, just for those, I mean, I think most of you know us. If you're in on this webinar, probably because you've received the invite from us, or um, are affiliated with us, uh, supporter, or know of us in some way. But um, we are a National Conservation Organization. We have a network of, of roughly 350,000 supporters across the country. We um, work on, you know, these are our main core programs. We work on uh, aquatic environments, both, uh, uh, both um, freshwater and marine environments, um, as well as uh, terrestrial ecosystems, and both of which also encompass species at risk. So there's a, we have a lot of focus on endangered species, uh, as well as um, a, an education focus. So we do um, work directly, either formal education in classrooms, but less informal uh, of outside of classroom education with public. Through all these um, avenues, uh, we have a theme of, of connecting people with nature as well. We do that in a number of ways. Um, one of which, one of which is specifically youth engagement through our Canadian Conservation Corps uh, and our Wild Outside program, which um, Canadian Conservation Corps uh, gives youth experience in a field setting in a conservation organization to put into practice and learn some uh, core conservation um, elements and work in that in that field. Uh, we also manage the iNaturalist Canada, which allows people to, uh, it's an app and online system, to report wildlife wild observations uh, across the country. And tying that in using iNaturalist Canada, we um, are also also run BioBlitzes and uh, an upcoming City Nature Challenge coming up in, uh, well, in the spring. Um, so with that, that's just a general overview of CWF. Uh, I will turn it over to um, Holly, who's going to give you a bit more specifics on the pollinator work um, that we're doing. And I will pass it on to her, and she'll talk about the pollinator program and, then, and lead in to our guest speakers. Thanks, James. Um, and hello to everybody who's joined in today. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, my name is Holly Bickerton. I'm an ecologist. I've been working with CWF on pollinator conservation since 2018. Um, James, could you just flip the slide to the next one? Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, I, in fact, I was just going to briefly introduce the webinars that we have had and that we have coming up. Um, as James mentioned, this is the second in a series. Uh, and if you missed the first one, it's available, as James mentioned, as a recording. It was uh, really a broad overview on this idea of creating pollinator habitats in otherwise uh, underused spaces. So the opportunities and examples from roadsides and other rights of way. Uh, and then the second webinar, which we'll hear shortly. And I'm pleased to announce today our third webinar, which is confirmed now for Tuesday, the 10th of March at one o'clock. Our speakers are Michelle Valla and Janet Tizik from Lanark County, which is a rural municipality just to the west of Ottawa. And their presentation will describe Lanark's experience with reducing, reducing mowing on rural roadsides to benefit pollinators. They've also used integrated management techniques, integrated vegetation management techniques, uh, hydro seeding with native plant seeds, and they're going to detail some of their costs and cost savings and the outreach activities that they've undertaken. So it should be very informative. Um, if you are registered for today's webinar, you will receive an invitation. Uh, and you can also watch for further details on the CWF webinars page. Uh, I should also acknowledge and thank the Habitat Stewardship Program from Environment and Climate Change Canada that has supported this series. And with that is it for the housekeeping, I promise, and I will just introduce today's speakers. Uh, so joining us today from Toronto, Corey Wells is a project manager uh, with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Corey graduated with a Master of Science in Hydrology from the University of Waterloo. He's spent the last 10 years working within the field of environmental research, management, and design across a variety of scales, including Alberta's oil sands region, the James Bay lowlands of Northern Canada, and more recently within Toronto's urban context. As project manager, Corey leads the overall planning and design of the Meadowways Active Transportation Network. And Katie Turnbull is a senior project manager with the Meadowway. She has 13 years of experience in TRCA's integrated restoration group. Katie has experience managing and implementing habitat restoration projects, including wetlands, streams, forests, shorelines, and meadows across Toronto and the greater Toronto area. She has an area of focus in York Region, Rouge National Urban Park, and the Meadowway. So welcome to both of you. And we will just turn the mic over to you. All right, and I'm just going to be a minute here. We're going to allow um, Katie and Corey to bring up their screen here as well. Okay, well, hello, everyone. I'm just double checking. Uh, this is Corey speaking. I'm just double checking that we can, uh, in fact, see the presentation here. Uh, I'm not seeing it yet, so no, we'll be able okay. to... Let's, uh... I think it's coming up. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, we're seeing it now. All right, we, uh, everyone can see that okay? Yeah. Okay, well, perfect. Well, James, Holly, thanks uh, again for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks all for the opportunity to speak with you today. Again, my name is Corey Wells. Um, with the Metaway Project, I'm really leading the design and implementation of the active transportation side of things with respect to this project. Um, kind of looking at today's agenda, um, we could probably talk for hours, Katie and I, but I know in the essence of time, we're going to kind of boil the Metaway down into some component parts. What I'd like to do is just chat a little bit about kind of one or two slides on what conservation authorities are in Ontario, and then really get into the weeds by providing a bit of background on the Metaway, how we got to that project today, what it is, what it isn't. And then before handing off the mic to Katie, who will really get into the uh, um, details of the meta restoration process, what I'd like to do is provide a bit of context in terms of the planning design and implementation framework and kind of the layered complexity of working within hydro corridors, particularly in kind of a dense urban setting. So kind of hopping right into it. So first of all, really what is a conservation authority and what is the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority specifically? Um, I'll be referring to the Toronto Region Conservation Authority as the TRCA. Uh, so that'll probably be the only acronym I'll use today, but uh, we've been operating since 1957. We're one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario uh, incorporated under the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, we 
have a jurisdiction that spans nine watersheds within the city of Toronto. So it's a quite a large area. We work with our municipal partners, other levels of governments, and uh, a variety of organizations to serve the community by protecting, conserving, and restoring the natural resources. Uh, we do community resilience through education, application of science, engagements, and a host of other activities. Um, this slide here really kind of provides a sense of scale with respect to the jurisdiction we cover in the GTA. I've also kind of slotted in the Medaway project just to kind of give you a sense of where it is located in the eastern end of Toronto, specifically in Scarborough, and also provide you a sense of scale. It's quite a large project spanning about 16 kilometers. So kind of hydro corridors today. Well, uh, in the GTA, we actually have over 500 linear kilometers of transmission corridor. Um, operationally, these corridors are quite often heavily maintained. So for instance, many of them are mown up to eight times a year, which of course trans, uh, you know, uh, refers to a lot of capital costs for municipalities and as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Um, from an ecological perspective, they're comprised primarily of non-native fescue grass. So low, low biodiversity, poor ecological and hydrological function. And typically from a public realm perspective, they haven't really historically been viewed as um, a place that many people want to spend their Sunday afternoons. So, um, you know, the interesting thing to think about when you're, you know, driving by a hydro corridor is that these linear features have really kind of remained as a fixed, unchanging component of an ever-changing urban fabric and, you know, placed at least within the context of the expected growth for the Toronto area, for instance, a 40% increase in the population by 2041 or over 50% of the people in the province of Ontario calling the GTA home, uh, we need to start thinking a bit more creatively on how we can unlock and better utilized what have traditionally been heavily underutilized green spaces. And these hydro corridors really have emerged as an untapped, um, uh, albeit unlikely candidate for this process. The goal really through projects like the Metaway and others is to convert what has historically been viewed as this to something like this. So something we like to kind of call applying the Metaway treatment. Um, Corey, Corey yes. sorry, to, sorry to jump in. Um, we're seeing both your the presenter view and your- Oh, I see. Current slide. Is there any way that you can? Yeah, let's give that, that a over? shot. Let's see. Um, yeah, I guess it's coming up on here. Okay, give me one second. Sure. Yeah, that's How that's good. Seeing your whole screen. Yeah. All oh, right. It's, okay. It's just changed. It just flipped back though now. Oh, it did. Eh. Okay. So how do we? How do we? Uh... How about that? Uh, yep. Yeah, we're so, seeing the presentation now. Yeah. Okay, so you're seeing just the, the main slide? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so, you know, now thinking about the, the Metaway itself, it's like, well, can we really transform hydro corridors from what have, you know, really been an underutilized green space? And I think through the work, um, some of the work undertaken by a restoration team, really with Katie Turnbull leading the charge on this, I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. And I'd like to quickly touch on one of the pilot studies that really took us to where we are with the Metaway today. This is an area of um, actually the Metaway. I've highlighted it in the top of the slide here in red. Uh, it's referred to as a Scarborough Center Butterfly Trail. Um, prior to 2011, this was a 3.5 kilometer section of the Gatineau Hydro Corridor where the Metaway is located. As I mentioned previously, this section of corridor was mown up to eight times annually. It was quite barren and underutilized. And through a generous donation by the W. Garfield Weston Foundation and our partners, the City of Toronto and Hydro One, we went in there and completely transformed the space. I think the images on the bottom of this slide really can convey the transformational opportunity of this kind of work better than I ever could. You know, we have the image on the bottom left-hand slide that shows, you know, what we all would imagine a typical corridor to look like pre-restoration. The center image really shows, you know, that exact same location three years later, what the meadow transformation process can do. And the image on the bottom right, I think really encapsulate, encapsulates the whole Metaway project. So we have an active transportation component with children using this space, set within the backdrop of a restored meadow habitat, all the while still functioning for its primary purpose, which is the transfer of power to the city of Toronto. So this is a bird's eye view of a snapshot of the Metaway. This is at an area of Daventry Road in Scarborough. And I think it does a good job highlighting some of the key elements that form the Metaway project. For instance, we have the multi-use trail that really forms the backbone of the Metaway. Uh, we have, of course, the restored meadow habitat you see here kind of highlighted in yellow. And I think it really contrasts nightly, nicely in this image with the public school grounds. These are, you know, this is a mown, mown grass, which you can imagine prior to restoration, this entire corridor would have looked like. 
Um, it's also important to remember though that, you know, for decades, this corridor would have just been mown grass. And so a lot of the neighborhoods that abut this property, you know, have become sort of used to that. And so we want to be good neighbors when we're restoring these corridors. And what we often do is, well, we implement a, 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 a variety of different elements, one of which is what we refer to as a buffer strip. So we ensure that there's a bit of separation between the abutting uh, properties and the actual meadow habitat that we mow several times a year just to provide a bit of space. Uh, because the multi-use trail is a big component of this project, we implement additional features for pedestrian safety. So, you know, the Medway, for instance, crosses 32 different roads, ranging from very quiet suburban streets to four or five lane major arterial roads. So, for in, in this case, we have an enhanced mid-block crossing and associated trail infrastructure. And another important piece uh, from this slide is the allotment garden. So, a lot of the uh, individuals we speak to on this project have voiced um, an interest in looking at additional opportunities potentially for uh, urban agriculture and allotment gardens are one example of a few of these features we actually have in the Meadowway today. So the Meadowway itself really kind of builds off of the success of the Scarborough Center Butterfly Trail. Again, this pilot study we undertook and once complete, it'll restore over 200 hectares of meadow habitat and it will contain over 16 linear kilometers of multi-use trail. When complete, you'll be able to walk, bike, hike, whatever active mode of transportation you choose from downtown Toronto all the way to uh, the Rouge National Urban Park via one seamless multi-use trail connection. The image um, you see in the center of this slide represents the full extent of the Meadowway from east to west. It's about 16 linear kilometers, cutting through uh, a wide variety of different community types, uh, infrastructure components, and ravine systems. So, Today, we're really in what's referred to as phase one of the Medway project. So in April of 2018, we received a very generous donation by the W. Garfield Weston Foundation who pledged up to 25 million with a firm commitment of 10 million uh, available immediately to undertake this phase one component. The phase one works has really been underway since about 2018 and it's taking us to about the end of this year. And you can really think of the phase one components uh, comprising three main variables. First, of course, we have the meadow restoration work, which Katie will be able to talk to in much greater detail uh, once I'm done my portion of today's presentation. But we also have a very detailed and engaged uh, community education and communication division. Um, you know, I hope they can forgive me for trying to summarize all the work they do just on one slide, but, you know, through the Meadowway, we really want to develop a sense of excitement and galvanize the community to develop a sense of ownership for this space. And so we engage with local schools, newcomers to Canada, and uh, a variety of different partnering organizations to really get people aware and get their hands dirty, so to speak. And, and additionally, this project really is a local asset for the community, but it's also, you know, we're hoping to be a blueprint for revitalization as it's one of the largest quarter revitalization works in Canada. And so the communication piece is important because we want not only the local community to know, but we want to engage with external partners, perhaps other linear quarter revitalization projects, both closer to home and uh, internationally to maybe learn a thing or two from them and vice versa. And where I step in and what the rest of my presentation will really be talking about is sort of a, the infrastructure planning, design and implementation. So in this case, the construction of the public realm space like the multi-use trail and a variety of pedestrian bridges and associated infrastructure. So what I wanna do with this slide is kind of switch gears quickly and talk a little bit about some of the technical aspects around sort of the multi-layered, in some cases complex stakeholder structure um, as it relates to actually undertaking work within hydro corridors in Toronto. Um, with respect to the Metaway sort of as the case study here, the hydro corridor that we work in is actually um, owned by what's referred to as Infrastructure Ontario and they own this piece of land uh, on behalf of the province of Ontario. Through a mechanism referred to as a statutory easement, Hydro One Incorporated manages the hydro corridor for its primary use, which is really just the safe and efficient movement of power from Gatineau to the city of Toronto. Now, in areas of the corridor where public realm infrastructure is either planned or already exists, the city of Toronto is able to undertake that work through what's referred to as a master park license. And they become a licensee to use those lands for what's referred to as secondary uses, in this case, park and public space. And they're responsible for the construction, maintenance and operation of that park space and they pay a fee to do so. Um, looking at the Meadowway, the TRCA or the Toronto Region Conservation Authority has an interesting role to play. We, of course, lead the planning and implementation of all of the, um, you know, metal restoration and actual infrastructure development. But we do so sort of in a third party role. We develop all the applications that then are rooted through the city of Toronto as a licensee, 
which is then approved by Hydro One and Infrastructure Ontario through this kind of secondary land use program. And I know this slide is somewhat convoluted, but really that's kind of the point. I want to try to convey that often when you're working in these hydro corridors, it's somewhat, somewhat of a multi-layered complex space that you have to navigate. What I'd like to touch quickly on this slide here is the Provincial Secondary Land Use Program. Again, this will be quite specific to, of course, operations within Ontario, but the great thing uh, about actually undertaking work in these corridors is that Hydro One and Infrastructure Ontario have actually developed a program that allows for secondary uses. In this case, uh, as I mentioned previously, these corridors are meant obviously to transport power safely, but secondary uses can be undertaken in these spaces such as parks and trails or you know, subsurface utilities like pipelines or even parking lots. Um, some of the key features or considerations for you know, any uh, manager or authority that looks to undertake their own work in their, in their respective municipality is that the Provincial Secondary Land Use Program is administered jointly between Hydro One and Infrastructure Ontario. So they both review all applications that are submitted for work. Um, they're the ones that provide, you know, a temporary license agreements. So you can actually go into that space and undertake the work. And really the reason why this program exists is that whatever you're developing and proposing, they have a chance to review to really ensure that it's jiving with their existing and planned uh, operations. Uh, the nice thing about this is it really establishes a priority for public use. So, you know, if a developer had um, you know, a, par a, par a private parking lot for, a, rec uh, for a, a condo versus an authority such as ourselves looking to do something like the Metaway will have priority here. Um, with respect to implementation of infrastructure, in Ontario we follow a fairly rigid uh, environmental assessment process. Um, the one we get to do though is a little bit more streamlined. It's set up for uh, more standardized planning processes for projects that have a more predictable set of environmental effects. This is a way to ensure that when we're implementing infrastructure in a corridor, we do so in a way that really takes into account all the potential impacts, not only to the environment, but the socioeconomic environment that it's being constructed in. Um, it's referred to as a municipal class environmental assessment process, and it really has three different schedules, if you want to think about them that way, that range from different levels of complexity and cost. You have something such as a Schedule A or A+. plus. It's a very simple, low complexity project. That would be, for instance, if you were building a trail through the right of way with no bridges or anything like that. That would be a pre-approved process with no public consultation. Moving up the scale of complexity, we have something as more, as more complex as a bridge construction. This would be a Schedule C project. The most complex, the most costly, the highest potential for potential effects. And this is what the Metaway falls under. So it's a much more comprehensive framework we needed to follow, much longer uh, time frame for implementation, and also contains a fairly comprehensive consultation program. Now, if you're a manager looking to undertake your own work in a corridor, and you are uh, trying to identify what kind of environmental assessment process you might trigger, it really comes down to cost. How much does your project cost? And that'll really um, dictate what kind of schedule you fall into. If you look at the first row here, you know, the construction or removal of a trail within an existing right of way, like a corridor, you actually have no limit there and you can be pre-approved without any consultation requirements at all. In the case of the Metaway, which I've highlighted here in red, uh, because we have six kilometers of multi-use trail and over four pedestrian bridges, our costs are a little bit higher. Therefore, we trigger that more comprehensive schedule, the Schedule C program, which involves that detailed consultation uh, requirements, which I'll touch on shortly. As I'm starting to wrap up my portion of the presentation, I'm kind of zooming in on one of the future sections of the Metaway. This is at the Ellesmere Ravine um, in Scarborough. And this particular portion of, uh, of the Metaway will involve multi-use trail, restored meadow, and a pedestrian bridge. Um, this is a kind of uh, rendering that kind of conveys what this transformational process will look like. But you know, this is a complex space for construction and there are a lot of considerations that need to be made when actually undertaking this work. There's a significant level of planning, design and studies that need to be undertaken. For instance, detailed baseline studies. If you're building a bridge, for instance, you have to undertake geotechnical work or flood modeling to ensure that whatever you're building in a ravine doesn't you know, increase the floodplain, for instance. Um, and working with you know, the landowners like Hydro One or Infrastructure Ontario in the case of our work in the GTA, there's a lengthy review process that you have to really consider when setting up your work plans. Um, so as I wrap up, as I mentioned, the Metaway had a fairly detailed consultation program, which really was a huge foundational element of our work. We reached out to a variety of different uh, stakeholders and members of the public, and they really helped provide us a sense of what they're looking for in this space. Uh, we had different committees set up both from a technical and more of a public perspective to really ensure that we were considering everything we needed to when working in a space as diverse as the Metaway. 
Um, last but not least, one thing we were able to do, uh, which really helped us galvanize interest in this project was undertake what's referred to as a visualization toolkit. Uh, I'd be happy to touch on this more at the end of the presentation, but this was a way for us to really, you know, a lot of people don't understand or can't visualize what a transformational project in a hydro corridor could look like. And so we worked with a landscape architect firm to develop a set of rendering sketches and animations, et cetera, so that when we went and engaged with the public, we could convey to them what this transformational opportunity could bring. Um, so I know I flew at about 30,000 feet above a lot of that, and I'm sure there are many questions. So um, I'm happy to answer any of those uh, towards the end of this presentation. But I think that kind of ends it for my component. And I'm just going to hand off the mic to uh, Katie Turnbull. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. So today I'm going to walk you through uh, our restoration uh, work that we've done within the Meadowway. And Corey's touched on a lot of great points of kind of the, the hierarchy with the planning side of things. But I want to break down really what are our, what's, what's the meadow restoration and how does that work? And uh, what are our goals and benefits? And then I'm going to work, walk you through some design typicals and we'll see the different strategies that we, you know, we're looking at. And then I'll move into restoration process and our actual steps that we took and then follow that up with adaptive management and uh, maintenance. So to start off, let's talk about some goals that uh, you know, we're looking to, to hit within the Meadowway. So one of the big ones, improve natural cover for wildlife. If you look up to the picture on the right-hand side, you see that the corridor is quite long, 16 kilometers, and there's a variety of different um, ravines that break this up. So it's a really amazing linear corridor that will really connect to this ravine system, increase biodiversity and improve the aesthetic appeal of the area. Uh, one of the big ones here is the mowing, and, and Corey touched on it, just how many times currently that they were mowing and the carbon footprint with that. So um, just by putting in the meadow restoration and paths and trails or allowing um, the intake of roots to help uh, store that water and uh, with carbon sequestration and a few other great benefits will improve this area for, uh, for the better. So one of the things we move into is the concept plan and examples. So when we're talking with Hydro Run Infrastructure Ontario, City of Toronto, and our outside partners, we really want to look at what does the design look like? So what are our setbacks? So Corey showed it in the original um, drawing of uh, the overview uh, image that showed the trail and the distance from the, the, the meadow and uh, the backdrop of the public line behind but I want to talk about the hydro trail that uh, the orange line that's there and making sure that when you're thinking about a project you're thinking about how hydro is going to be able to get to their their lines and maintain them the nice thing about a meadow is it does pop up again if it's driven over we don't put any woody debris or anything like that within these quarters just because we are under an electrical uh, wire system and we want to make sure that if there's an emergency hydro uh, can get to their towers and, and manage them as they need to one of the other things when you're looking at this map is the circles that you see on the map are the actual hydro towers. So we keep a 15 meter buffer of a low grow mix around those towers and then elsewhere we, the growth of the wildflowers and grasses are a little higher. What you also see on here is the shrub nodes. So that's the green areas. So City of Toronto helps us to plant those and they help to manage the invasives that, uh, that kind of move in and, and coordinate with that. One of the big things on this map is uh, the setback. So we do have the 3.25 meter setback on the trails. That's for sight lines and safety. And then we also have the setback five meter from the, the homes. We also have out know, here, you can see, if I move my mouse, the big M's that are on the map. So those are monitoring plots and those monitoring plots um, allow us to do floral studies and to outline the pre and post of what's on the site. And then we have our typical signage and monitoring plots. So this is again, this is just a typical that we have for the Meadowway, but it just shows at, uh, the size of the monitoring plots. Usually they're 20 by 20 with one meter offsets and we put these throughout so we can uh, manage those. We also show what our sign, our temporary signs look like, and it's a detailed schematic. So if you're looking to send anything through to Hydro One Infrastructure Ontario, you'll need to follow this similar process with a full checklist to be illustrated that outlines exactly what you're proposing and then um, put it through for the permit process. When it comes to our meadow typicals, every meadow is completely different. So not all of them will look like this. Not all of them um, will be the same as your last one you do. Um, typically in the Meadowway, the most, most of the typicals that we have are the native dry uh, meadow species. So this middle section in this area right here, that typically is what you'll see in the Meadowway. Um, at the moment, there's no wet pockets and, and wetland features, but it is always a potential to add in uh, due to hydrology and the flow of the land and putting in these wetland features down the line. 
Uh, if you have parkland or anything like that on the outsides or forest edge that's not in the hydro corridor, then you can look at adding uh, woody debris, hibernaculums, um, and just a different, different variety of, of, uh, of natural wooded habitat. Um, it brings in birds, it brings in wildlife, and it's just a really good way to uh, give yourself a little texture and height. So your field assessments, before you actually start uh, doing work within uh, any meadow way project, uh, what you really want to do is focus on what's existing soil conditions. Um, what are you looking to monitor? Is it flora, fauna? Currently we're doing butterflies, birds, flora, fauna, and, and the mix of things. We're hoping to get into bees as well. Um, there's a, a few research topics we'll touch on shortly, but the invasive species as well. What is that, that starting point? What do you have for your invasive species? Uh, ourselves, we have dog strangling vine. Uh, buckthorn, Phragmites, Japanese knotweed, the list goes on. There's quite a long, long one. Uh, Canada thistle is probably another great one that we do find comes up the first couple of years and can be very aggressive and, and push the meadow out. Uh, you want to start mapping all of these things. Map your edges, map, map where each species can be found. Again, all of this will depend on your budget and what you're able to actually do and, and move forward with. Uh, the big one I can mention too is the create a three to five year management plan. This would be key because if you don't create this plan, you're not going to be able to think about succession and how is the meadow going to change. Are you looking for your meadow to uh, always stay as a meadow or do you want to see it transition to more of a shrub kind of thicket area? Are you directly under a hydro tower or are you on a, a road edge or do you just have pipelines? What is your, what is your structure that you're dealing with in terms of your uh, right of way? And then uh, stay informed and uh, just really try to make sure that you're not closing off uh, different ideas that might come up on invasive species, those best management practices, how you manage those things. You really want to be focused in on, on keeping an open mind. Maybe there's a new technique on meadow restoration that you didn't know about before, or maybe there's a new best management on how to manage dog strangling vine, uh, that specific species. So try to always keep an open mind to other practitioners that might provide input. So I wanted to touch base on just hydro hydrological improvements. Uh, if you're looking at this, you see the turf grass. I'm sure a few of you are familiar with this type of slide. Uh, turf grass, if you envision a water droplet dropping on the turf grass, the root structure that's there, it's only about two inches tall. It really can't capture that water droplet. And a lot of the time, the water will start to run off. And, th and this increases flooding and, uh, and that sort of thing within the ravine systems. As you get into a meadow restoration, whether it's grasses or wildflowers, these species that you see in front of you are all within the meadow way. And you can see the root structures that 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 uh, provides and really increases that capture of, of a really severe rain event. And if you were a bunch of uh, droplets of water coming into this scenario, uh, those roots would help to, to keep it. You could also see the structure and material that's above the soil that also will stop you know, water from quickly running off the surface. So these plants really help to stop erosion, stop uh, uh, wind from removing soil. And really, if you have a steep bank or anything like that, it will also help to hold that structure down. So I just want to get into a bit of the actual restoration. So typical restoration for a meadow is, it takes three years to really get things going. So that first year is the, the site prep. You want to go out and, and, and get, your, get your area prepped. The second year is your actual seeding. And the third year, you begin your adaptive management process. Again, all of this is based on what your budget is. So not everyone can spend you know, a full year to do the preparation. When it comes to site prep for us, uh, luckily, the uh, Garfield Weston Foundation has been able to fund this project and uh, we're able to spend a full year to work on site prep. So we'll start off with identifying the buffer areas and we'll leave again that mowed strip on the outside, which gets mowed by the City of Toronto. And then we'll start outlining our signage and that signage is there to, to help uh, educate what is going on within the area. And we use temporary signs, so those temporary signs get switched out. Uh, each year and there's a three-year cycle of temporary signs and then we use those on new meadow sections uh, as we move forward. So we mow till and expose uh, uh, soils and what we're looking for with this is really to to get the seed source that's hidden under the soil and really spike that plant to be able to um, uh, constantly have it start to come up and then it will, it will, it will, will spike it again with another till and by doing that what you're doing is you're causing the plant to to break open the seed to come up and we don't know what's under the soil once we start tilling so it gets the process to allow the plant to come up and then we break up the root system and then hopefully there's not too many invasives where we're spreading additional invasives but it allows us to to kind of kill the initial uh, seed source that's in that soil and with that at the same time we'll do a seed with cover crop so what that means is the broadcast seeder you see here 
it'll start spreading. It could be a variety of different cover crops, rye, oats. Uh, typically uh, we use um, uh, annual species. It could be millet, that sort of thing. And we'll just spread it out throughout the field at a very high ratio. And so just touching on our cover crop seeding and trials, um, there's a different variety that you could use depending if your site's really bumpy, I would suggest making sure that you run a roller over it first to make it really compacted. Native seeds typically like compacted soil, so this is something you want to see. You want to also make sure you have a lot of soil to sun contact. Uh, we also will run a harrow over, which is the bottom right corner, and the harrow looks something similar to this, uh, and that just helps the, the seed of the cover crop that we put down to really start to establish to that soil sun seed connection. And here's some of the oats that are starting to grow. Uh, we like to use oats for the most part. Um, we are going to be trying out some millet and a few uh, rye options as well. Again, if you get a chance to, to try different cover crops, different seed mixes, I would recommend it because it gives you a wealth of knowledge as you move forward. And then, so that was all the first year. Now we're moving into the second year. Now we're starting to seed with wildflowers and grasses. And so this would typically happen early spring that we use a Truax seed drill. And for the most part, currently the meadowway has been seeded by Ontario Nativescape. And they've came and, uh, and helped us work uh, with the, the seeding process and have seeded the majority of the current uh, meadowway portion. And so your native seed collection, where are you sourcing your plants? Uh, obviously it's, it's definitely easier to work with an area that's larger than a smaller area because there's less movement on bringing your equipment all the time and, um, and dealing with constant um, drop off and pick up of your, of your machines. But uh, we are typically looking at a 40 to 80 hectare uh, parcels that we're working on each year. And um, typically if you wanna look at ordering your plants, you wanna think 1.5 to two years in advance, start ordering the species. Um, there's, I would recommend uh, custom seed mixes based on you know, what your soil types are and what you're looking to do. Uh, you can also look at uh, your local native suppliers and see if they supply seed from your local seed zone. Um, and then you'll have to be thinking infill as you go because not every meadow is going to come up 100%. There's always going to be invasive species or areas where the birds and wildlife eat some of your seed and that sort of thing. Uh, so meadowway seed, how do we mix? We created five mixes. Uh, butterfly mix, wetland mix, uh, dry grass, short dry mix, and a resilient mix. These all have a different variety of percentage of grasses. So if you have a site that is very urban and, and it's right down in the heart surrounded by homes, I would really recommend that you push um, a heavier amount of wildflowers. Uh, that's just because you want it maybe a bit more showy. As we get into more of the industrial areas within the meadowway, we increase our grass mixes. So that's where you see the 70% grass mixes for an area that's more industrial. And to me, I enjoy a, a beautiful field of big blue stem uh, you know, blowing in the wind, but not everybody does. And so we need to be thinking about uh, the visualization uh, image of it, which is the bottom right hand corner. And so this is that second year. So we would have seeded in, in May and now we're now moving into um, uh, probably in August uh, time frame. So you can see there's an existing trail that was already there before we started the meadowway. There's the buffer and then you can see some of the uh, annual um, cover crop coming up with a few wildflowers starting to come through. Again projection that second year is all into the roots. So everything's focusing on that root growth and here we have back to the year one and then here we have year three. So year three uh, that's the following year and now you're starting to see some wildflowers that are starting to come up. They're just realizing that, you know, the root structures have been growing for a full year and now they're really starting to uh, establish with their stems. But you notice they're fairly thin. So what we'll do is a quick adaptive management on this field and we'll quickly go out and, uh, and actually mow the site after. And when you mow the site the following year, you cause the plants to all of a sudden think, okay, now it's time to stop focusing on my roots and I'm going to come out and really start to establish as as a larger structure. And so this is year four, the exact same picture. And you can see with that quick mow early spring before the breeding birds come back, it allows your, your plants to, to all of a sudden put all their energy and nutrients into the above the soil uh, growth. So just a quick snapshot of adaptive management. Uh, again, thinking uh, of doing some sort of stratification mowing uh, every three to five years. Uh, if you are able to burn in an area that doesn't have hydro towers or maybe it's a right of way along a roadway that you are able to burn, then that would be the preferred option. But uh, with the meadow way, we are not able to burn. So we need to look at other disturbances of the soil just to make sure we're always keeping that soil to sun contact. And then meadow restoration research. So this is some of the stuff that we're hoping to tap in over the next few years. But 
what is the heat island effect? Does that change when you put uh, a meadow? It definitely changes for trees, but uh, is there a, a connection there when it comes to uh, wildflowers and grasses? Uh, soil improvements, what does it do to the soil? This one will take, be a bit tricky to find because it does take a long time for that organic matter to build up, but something to look into. Uh, flooding and flood attenuation, how do we hold water with meadow species versus grasses? Um, carbon recapture and sequestration. So these are all just great questions that we're hoping to answer over the next few years. Uh, dog strangling vine, just one of the invasives that we deal with all the time. We did have a researcher from University of Toronto that was uh, looking at this, Emmett, and uh, he did a great job and we're hoping to continue his, his research because it's just another way of looking at best management practices for invasive species. So again, here's that uh, adaptive management mode that we do roughly every, just once every three to five years. And then here's later that exact fall uh, as the plants are all coming up and uh, you can see just the difference there. It's, it's pretty impressive. So again, only three, every three to four years. Again, each meadow is gonna be different. So it might be every other year, depending on, on the uh, time frame. And then just last, we move into the monitoring and terrestrial inventory. So I can't uh, express it enough to do pre and post monitoring. You really want to focus on those key performance indicators and, and what, is, what is success. Um, and the only way to do that is really to begin monitoring and start to track some of this stuff. So we do transects uh, for butterflies. We do monitoring for birds, uh, monitoring plots. And this year, we're hoping to get into bees and the specific species that are, are living, living within the meadow way. And then the last thing I'll touch on is uh, when you're out in the meadow way, you might come across areas that are urban agriculture. And so we have spots where the meadow is completely surrounding a, uh, a community garden. And this provides a great access to pollinators and actually pollinating these vegetables. So again, it's another really good way to show that we can do urban agriculture with wildflowers and, and bring that together. And then my favorite is if you build it, they will come. Uh, if we don't build it, then unfortunately our pollinator um, uh, species just just need that little bit of help. You really need that chance. And uh, as you can see, this happy uh, go lucky pollinator right here is just covered in pollen. And uh, this is a picture right in the heart of the meadow way. So um, you really get an idea of how how happy they are with using uh, that as a backdrop. Okay, so that that's the end of our presentation. I'm going to uh, um, pass the mic back to Corey. And um, I don't know if we can start maybe with planning questions and then move into restoration questions. But uh, that would be kind of my thought. That way we don't have to jump back and forth with the mic. Excellent, thanks so much. That's uh, some great overview and I'm sure a lot of information for some people to, to take in all at once. So there might be some digesting going on. Um, We've got, a, yeah, definitely a few questions coming in. Um, so to try and focus more on the planning side of things, I guess one question, and it ties to something that was raised as well, is the kind of the scalability of this. Um, you know, how how easy is it to go bigger, go smaller? I think some people on the in the webinar might also be, you know, property owners on a small scale, but also other companies that are thinking much larger scale. Um, so, and in that sense, you know, how, how and why did you choose um, the Medaway in particular as your, as your pilot to start with? So, I mean, maybe I'll touch on that one, actually, because uh, it all started with a local councillor. And um, the councillor brought the idea to our attention to maybe start putting some, uh, some wildflowers and grasses in the meadow. And then through that, it turned into an actual grant that from there started to take off. And, uh, and we were able to build the kind of the, the original pilot project. So uh, with this one, it just really started as an idea. And uh, the more that we started talking with the different groups, then we started building that into the, the larger scale. So we did start with 40 hectares originally. Um, it, it was broken down into three years over that five year um, plan. So three years of actual restoration and two years of management, adaptive management. So um, each year we'd start with 20 hectares, uh, and then move for another 20 and then do the final uh, 10. So again, started off with just that first 20 and then building on that. So, I, you know, you don't have to go that, that large. You can go as much as half an acre, um, whatever you happen to want to do. But uh, that's really how this one started. And then from this one as the pilot, then we realized, wow, look at the benefit that it's doing for, you know, this specific, specific area. And then we started building on that. Great. Um, Thinking along the terms of planning, um, 
people, some people are wondering as well, like how long when you're thinking about when you, when the project idea came up to actually seeing like the project starting and undertaking, you know, undertaken. So like how, as far as the planning process goes to actually kind of, I guess, getting the first bit of work started. Is it a long process to get that going? Yeah, so I'll, um, I think maybe Katie and I can both answer this question since um, kind of the meta restoration work is, you know, it's related but kind of separate from some of the planning uh, that needs to be undertaken for some of the infrastructure that's uh, in place. So with respect to the MetaWay, uh, because we are, um, so to provide a bit of context, the MetaWay is about 16 kilometers long from end to end. There's about 10 kilometers of existing multi-use trail. Um, however, it's heavily fragmented um, and the gaps that do exist in that network um, are, you know, crossed by, you know, fairly significant ravine systems, um, but also, as I mentioned previously, 32 roads and a ton of man-made infrastructure. We have active rail corridors, for instance, um, and another, a, a few of other pieces. So the Metaway, you know, you know I think is representative of a, 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 a comprehensive revitalization project. And because of the magnitude of the work we need to undertake, we had to do, as I mentioned, that Schedule C environmental assessment process. And so that just to get from kind of day one to actually approving the environmental assessment, which the purpose of which was to really identify the potential conceptual alignments of where the future bridges and trails could go, that took us about a year from, from start to finish. Um, and now that, that environmental assessment, which again developed the conceptual placement of all the infrastructure, uh, was complete. Um, that was just actually December of, of 2019. Now we're moving into kind of the more technical detailed design process, which will actually take, you know, about another year to get to the point where we really can actually start getting some shovels in the ground. So with respect to infrastructure, at least at this scale, um, it's taking us, you know, just shy of two years which you know, some could argue is a little bit long, but I would make the argument that that's actually pretty quick for some projects to actually start getting some public realm infrastructure in the ground. And, but I, as I mentioned in the, in, in the PowerPoint earlier, it depends on the, the, the magnitude of your project. If you have a corridor where you, know, you don't have any pedestrian bridges or you're not crossing over a stream, for instance, and you just wanna put down a multi-use trail, um, that planning framework might fall within the A category which is pre-approved no consultation that might take a couple months and then you know once you undertake your your technical planning you can be in the ground that same year so it really is project dependent i'm going to now hand the mic over though to katie who can talk i think a little bit about the actual meadow restoration piece yeah hi there so um yeah i think the the, the biggest thing this project is a seven-year project so that first year uh, while Corey is getting started on, on the EA process and that kind of two year to get things up and going, um, that's when we start submitting uh, at least the meadow footprint. So that could be the shrubs and that can be the meadow. So we're looking at four to six months just to get the approvals done. But then you have to be thinking high level. So while I'm doing that, Corey is also working with City of Toronto, uh, uh, Hydro One and uh, Infrastructure Ontario to try to get uh, the lease worked out so that we can actually do work. One of the key components with a lot of the work that we started in the early years was that we were actually able to um, work on areas of the, the meadow that are already leased by City of Toronto. So right now we're getting into certain areas that haven't been leased yet and that takes a bit longer to, uh, to line up uh, how we get the, the property kind of switch to a lease by the city and then then we'll start the actual restoration but we typically won't start any of the restoration until the city of toronto is is leasing the land and then it gets switched to us so uh it it takes time but it, you have to start with the original first year as like really the planning year we didn't really do that much in the actual um, meadow sections at all that first year and as you get into the second year that's where like kind of by midsummer i start getting out there with the actual equipment and we can start um hopefully on like a small section like uh 10 to 20 hectares. Okay, thanks. Um, there have been a f couple of questions uh, related to costs. Um, I think some are wondering about generally, and I, I know this might change depending on the area, but generally the kind of cost of undertaking this work per say per hectare. But I wonder if you could also maybe bring this in into the, what in relation to the costs of, you know, uh, hydros, normal maintenance cost if so had nothing been done what would the cost of kind of hydro's maintenance be on a site like this versus the cost of um restoring and the ongoing kind of, i guess cost of it but also what what might be the cost per acre to get this off the ground as far as yeah, so 
for sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll touch on like if we're looking at it from um, um, we typically work in, in hectares. So if we're looking at just I'm just speaking of the meadow and, and shrub and that sort of thing. But uh, typically we're looking at if you can do a larger size. So if you're just doing uh, one hectare of land, then your costs are going to go up and, you know, could be anywhere. If you're able to put habitat and that sort of things in it, then it would be up to like 150K. But if, if you're if you're looking at an area that can only um, if you're looking at 20 to, to 40 hectares doing it all at once and because you're in a hydro corridor you can't put the woody habitat and that sort of thing then you'd be looking at somewhere around uh, 70k per hectare it really just depends on on how many hectares can you combine because it's it's less movement um, of equipment so you're you're out there and the equipment's there for a whole period of time you don't have to constantly take it away the smaller your project the the more budget that you're going to spend and it just it just depends but of course if you're putting a multitude of hectares or acres together then your your costs do go down so if i was looking at something like the uh, uh the meadowway for the restoration purposes i'd be somewhere around that 70 to 80 uh k bracket i think maybe corey if you want to touch on your side yeah i can provide some um some kind of high level kind of estimates for undertaking sort of the planning and implementation of the active infrastructure. So, um, you know, again, because we undertook the most comprehensive uh, environmental assessment process that really could get us to kind of conceptual alignments and uh, background information so that we could actually start the engineering design of the bridges and trails and stuff. The EA cost us, you know, plus minus, uh, you know, a million dollars in terms of like having consultants online and undertaking a full, um, you know, start to finish multi-phase environmental assessment process and again that number has the asterisk of it being that you know it's the most comprehensive type that we undertook and it's quite possible that uh, a number of these restoration projects won't involve the magnitude of infrastructure we have and the price tag for that could be much less um, and you know it's it's kind of hard to get into the specifics because every situation is different but to kind of highlight you know some examples like when you're implementing a bridge for instance you can typically guess that a standard pedestrian bridge is going to cost you like you know anywhere from 200 to 400 thousand dollars or maybe a little higher depending on its length and then you start getting into you know how much does you know a multi-use trail cost per you know linear meter and it could be you know uh, it really is dependent on whether or not you're constructing that trail uh, through a ravine which typically has a higher cost or if it's a relatively flat section of trail that's going right through um, the uh, the hydro right away so again the costs are, are really dependent on um, kind of the situation at hand okay um, and a few, uh, quite a few questions coming in on ongoing maintenance. And then we mentioned, uh, you know, the maintenance schedule varies depending on the site, maybe sometimes every three years, sometimes more often. Um, what can you, can you speak a little more about how to maintain the, on, or how to care the ongoing maintenance in light of, you know, there's persistent invasive species is watering needed. Um, who, who's doing these, you know, the mowings every three to five, three years or less. Uh, is that the, the city? Is that you guys in charge of that or is hydro still involved in the maintenance of the site? Yeah, no, for sure. I'll take this one. So, um, yeah, if we're looking at uh, uh, currently, because we're still within that seven-year uh, footprint, right now, all the adaptive management and maintenance has been done by TRCA. The only uh, part where um, City of Toronto will still mow the buffers, so that's the that outside five-meter buffer and the trail buffer. Everything else, the, the three- to four-year um, maintenance mow, uh, the yearly, and I, and I specify definitely meadows are quite a lot of work. Um, we are, are lucky to have a full crew out there from that April to November, but uh, they'll start in the fields uh, right in, in May. Uh, first thing dealing with garbage cleanup. I mean, just uh, uh, garbage that is blown in. And then as we move to, um, to getting more in the, the early summer, we'll start to move into the invasives like uh, garlic mustard. And right now we're going to be starting a lot of plots uh, and doing some trials to see uh, what works best on managing Canada thistle, what works best, and see if we can bring in some organic uh, options um, rather than just focusing on the herbicide uh, as, as our only option. We really want to push the envelope with the meadow way and, and try to get to that green level where we're focusing on um, either biocontrol or we're focusing on um, certain uh, species that will help to push out other like milkweed that can maybe we can use that species to help push out uh, other non-native species like DSV. Um, 
and really f focus on uh, on that. But uh, definitely, don't get me wrong. The the maintenance that goes into uh, uh, meadows are a lot in that first one to one to three years after the meadows up. Um, you're going to get Canada thistle in there for sure if you're in our region. Uh, of course, if you're in the states, it might be a, you know, different species and whatnot. But um, uh, Canada thistle is probably one of our arch nemesis in the meadowway, as well as dog strangling vine. The two of them uh, keep us very active. And, we're, and typically we're looking at digging up the roots um, and digging the plant out wholly. And this is where you can really start to pull in your community engagement. So we'll have corporate events, we'll have community events where people come out and, and that's your, your mass, that's your numbers of people that can grab a shovel and, and make, it, make it a lot easier to do some of your adaptive management. So I really would suggest using your local schools, using your communities and, uh, and, and getting everyone involved. And it, this is a, a team project. It's, it's not just uh, our group or, or another, it's, uh, it's really everybody as a whole. And through that adaptive management, um, we'll be marking everything, finding out which practices are working the best um, and uh, looking at uh, some oils and, and hot water treatments, or can we move towards uh, um, specifically with 20% uh, vinegar as options to take out some of the, uh, the plant, plants that are invasive that we don't want. So we're really looking this year at, at what works best, um, but that will really eat up most of your summer is just managing the, uh, the non-native species, um, which typically come in at about a 10% uh, of, your, uh, of your meadow. And it's critical those first two, three years after you've put it in the meadow to really be active on it. Once, you, once the meadow gets established and you've pushed out the invasives, then the meadow will take it from there. And it's actually pretty hard for the invasive species to push back into the meadow. Um, you know, these plants are fairly uh, tall and, and some of them much shorter, but just really robust root structures. And so once they're in, they're great. It's just you really have to focus on managing those uh, invasives that kind of first one to three years afterwards. Okay. So there's, not, there's the expectation that a lot of this will be kind of still sustaining over time that you won't have to keep doing too much ongoing maintenance. Yeah, yeah. So I just, can you just repeat that? I didn't catch that. Oh, sorry. Just, so it sounds like the expectation is that, you know, eventually this will be self-sustaining as a meadow and you won't have to be doing too much maintenance over the long term, right? Yeah, like that, that's the goal. I mean, everything depends on budget, right? Like, luckily, we do have the budget to put in the maintenance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a, an area that's more... Um, in an urban setting, then you, you're going to need to do a lot more maintenance to make it look uh, the way it needs to, um, just for a, a public perception uh, appearance wise. But if you have a, a meadow that's more in an agricultural setting, um, a rural landscape, then I would put in more grasses and then your, the grasses are more dominant. So they will help to push out a lot of those invasives. And then you can can set up your schedule of, you know, do you really need to worry about if eventually uh, a few shrubs get in? Um, you know, hydro typically will maintain uh, and clear out any shrubs that are there. But w what is your relationship with hydro? Like, what have you discussed on in, in terms of details and how this will be maintained? Uh, currently, right now, we're just working on what the long-term maintenance will be, whether uh, a portion might be uh, Toronto Conservation, portion might be um, Hydro One, it might be uh, City of Toronto. Like, that's all stuff that we're looking to and we're, we're looking to see about future funding because we really want to make sure that this project continues and so that's what we're actively working on right now. Great. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of great questions coming through so I apologize for not being able to get to all of them because it sounds like there's a lot of good feedback and generally everybody's you know starting off with great to see all of this engagement, great to see the work done so that's super positive. I'm wondering maybe if we could just end uh, on a last question that is a good I think a good way to leave it is um, any lessons learned on on others to get something like this off the ground? Did you have, you know, how receptive was Hydro One? Did you have barriers from uh, the public uh, that aren't, that were concerned about what was going on? Are there any kind of, you know, basic lessons learned? And I guess we don't have a ton of time to go through all that in depth, but I wonder if you can comment on that. That's a, that's a great question, and I feel like we could probably talk for at least an hour about the various things we've learned over time. I, I can provide a little bit of feedback from, from my perspective and then maybe finish off by handing the mic over to Katie with hers. I know that um, from like an operational perspective, um, the understanding needs to be that, um, you know, and I, I'll never be able to speak, obviously, for the landowner like Hydro One or, or Infrastructure Ontario, but in many cases, this land, you know, has, has, has been developed for the primary use, which is the transportation of, of power through their, their hydro corridor. And, um, 
one of the things I would recommend is having, um, you know, if you're starting this work for your first time, really having some patience and, 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 and try to really establish a strong relationship with, um, you know, the particular landowner in your hydro corridor as in many cases, this could be the first time they've ever actually undertaken work of this kind in their corridor. And uh, in many cases, they're, you know, naturally risk averse or need to also be educated on what this project actually is. And um, in some ways, you might notice that, you know, approval timelines and conversations might be taking longer than you think, but the, the thing you need to have in the back of your head is that it's a learning process for not just yourselves, but for them. And having the patience and really striving to develop that relationship, I think, has made at least our work moving forward easier and easier every day. And I think with respect to the public, um, you know, I can at least talking about the active transportation side of things and maybe just the project as a whole, it's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's one of those projects where it, the majority of people are interested to see something like this take place. You know, it's, it, it has been sort of, you know, corridors are sort of an underutilized space and they're like, Hey, you know, why don't we make it something we can actually enjoy walk in through, enjoy the, uh, the nature that uh, as part of the restoration process, for instance, but what also needs to be understood, especially in an urban context, like the Metaway is that a lot of people who have been, you know, lit living uh, beside a Metaway, have looked out into their backyard and seen manicured grass for 40 years and 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 that might be something that they're just used to and they find aesthetically pleasing to themselves um and so a big part of the work we do is you know you can imagine that you know all of a sudden you see this restoration process taking place and you know if you're a long-term resident you might have you'll be like all right well this is interesting i need to maybe learn a little bit about what's going on here and a big part of our learning experience is making sure that we don't assume that everyone in the community is immediately on board there is a strong education component here to really get people to understand why we're doing this what the benefits of it are you know and it's a wide-ranging benefits not just from you know dedicated multi-use trails to get you off the road and get out there and enjoy nature to, you know, really providing, you know, carbon sequestration, you know, hydrological improvements, you know, pollinator improvements, like a wide gamut of them. But, you know, for people perhaps in our industry, those benefits might seem obvious, but that's actually not the case. And you really have to be patient and work really closely with the community through door to door work or, you know, public open houses to really try to use in any opportunity, um, uh, to just you know provide an educational piece and I think Katie do you, do you want to add anything to to that final note yeah I mean I, again I could probably talk about 300 different learning lessons here but those are I guess the first ones that really come to mind are in Paramount great thank you and uh, I think that brings us uh, to the end of uh, our time here anyway um, Holly did you want to end with anything uh, as a follow-up, uh, I mean, basically, stay tuned. We're going to we're going to have another um, final webinar uh, in March. Um, yes, I think the first thing is to thank our our presenters. I know that this was a really rapid fire overview of the work that you've spent three years doing, so or more. Um, but it's been a really great window um, into this this type of major project. A uh, really good reflection of I think all the work that's been required so also thanks to people for tuning in a recording of this we will um, produce and post on the same website that I mentioned earlier if you google CWF webinars uh, you'll also receive a link to the recording so thank you for participating and we hope to you will join us again on the next one thank you everybody and thank you again yeah to our presenters yeah thank you everyone for your time Thanks, everyone.